On the official War Thunder channel, Gaijin put out a video on climbing the ranks with the Japanese Navy. Needless to say, since I'm making this, it has a few problems that need to be addressed. For the sake of brevity and copyright, I won't just show the whole video, but I'll show a few questionable statements, explain what I think is wrong with them, and a few things that Gaijin missed. I'll start where Gaijin starts, with the Type 5 Subchaser. As they put it, She's not the fastest, but has a lot of firepower, with one 75mm cannon and two 20mm auxiliary guns at her disposal. There's not much of an issue with this one, though I would say that the 75mm is much worse than an automatic 37 or 40mm cannon for the battle rating. The 25mm cannons have more overall damage output too, so if you're trying to play this one, I would recommend just using those primarily, so long as you can get close enough to do so. The 75mm has good damage per shell, but it has overall slow damage output compared to most auto cannons, so the 25mm is generally better to use primarily. Next up comes the premium Type 4 Model 4, where all they really point out is... The boat's mostly made of wood, but she comes with two aircraft engines, allowing her to reach the speed of 70 kph. Yeah, pretty impressive. This is probably the worst premium that Gaijin could show throughout the entire tree. It's an incredibly weak ship overall. The 37mm cannon is pathetically underpowered. It has a minuscule amount of explosive filler, dealing barely any damage to even the weakest PT boats. If you're actually considering buying this one, swap primarily to its dual 20mm cannons since those can deal some actual damage, but in general I just can't recommend it. Instead, check out the Akabono. It's a far, far stronger ship for its battle rating and only costs 3,000 Golden Eagles for a tier 5 premium. Gaijin then shows the three Type K subchasers, saying, Performance wise and gameplay wise, they're pretty similar. No, no, they are not. The Type K3 and Type K7 get incredibly powerful dual pom pom mounts, making them the strongest 2.3 vessels in the game as is, while the Type K8 gets a 76mm cannon. The K3 and K7 can play very aggressively and fight multiple targets with ease due to having two fully automatic mid caliber auto cannons. The K8 struggles to deal with multiple targets and has much lower overall damage output. To say they have similar performance is simply wrong, as that one weapon change really hampers the K8. Mid caliber auto cannons are the king of the coastal fleet, so not having those is a massive, massive blow to its combat performance. They also should have mentioned that the K series subchasers are adept at bow tanking, which lets them get closer to enemies while taking minimal damage. The next vehicle they show is the Type 11, saying, the Type 11 isn't known for her exceptional mobility or survivability, but she can be very dangerous if you keep your distance and make the most of her armament. The Type 11 is a battle rating 3.3 ship. It sees destroyers in every single match, which the 40mm can barely scratch at longer ranges. Lots of coastal ships it faces outgun it, especially at range, along with having more survivability. The worst piece of advice you can give is to keep your distance and try to kill enemies with the autocannons. Instead, get as close as possible, using terrain and cover to avoid being seen, and then strike at distances where the torpedoes of the ship will be undodgeable. It has the strongest torpedoes in the entire game, Type 16s. They're incredibly fast and have explosives equivalent to a full ton of TNT, so they'll sink just about anything they hit. Players should be focused on using its mobility to get in close and kill destroyers, not trying to snipe with the 40mm. If it faced purely coastal ships, that might work, but with it being the exact same battle rating as most of the reserve destroyers, staying back and playing into their strengths is just making yourself a target. Next up comes the Shonen, about which they say, This frigate has six hull sections and a crew of 150, making it a pretty hard nut to crack to say the least. It's one of the least survivable frigates in the game, and anything with an auto cannon or high caliber cannon will delete it really quickly. It really is not a tough nut to crack. They also point out, The Shonan is equipped with two 120mm cannons for its primary weapon. This is the first example of something in the video that's not actually modeled correctly. Shonan actually had three 120mm 10th year cannons, not two 120mm 3rd year cannons as shown in game. This isn't really an issue with the video, but it's worth pointing out, as there's a much worse example later. They also say, Not even destroyers are safe from a barrage like that. Destroyers are pretty safe from a barrage like that. Shonan doesn't put out many shells per minute, and the shells it does have are pretty weak, so pretty much any reserve destroyer should consistently beat it in a 1v1 engagement. It's also at a higher battle rating than most of those reserves, at 3.7. This thing can even face cruisers in an up tier. 
It really isn't very capable anymore due to the spawn change and destroyers becoming reserves, and it's probably one of the worst coastal ships to draw attention to. It would have made more sense to cover some of the Cold War frigates such as Chikugo and Isuzu, or talk about Ikazuchi and mention Akabono since it's a premium variant. They're generally stronger and more interesting due to their fully automatic 76mm cannons, so they're worth talking about more than this shonen. Next up comes the Blue Water Fleet, where things start to go from inaccurate to outright wrong. First is Mutsuki, where they mention, We have the Mutsuki-class destroyer that won our recent triathlon for reserve destroyers. That triathlon was very incorrect in how it rated the destroyers, and I almost made a video like this one on it. No, Mutsuki is not the strongest reserve, even after the fire rate buff. Frunza is incredibly strong at the same battle rating, and the Type 1924 Leopard is so much stronger than the rest that it even has a higher battle rating than every other reserve destroyer. In fact, the Type 1924 is so powerful that it's the most meta vehicle in naval tournaments where 4.0 destroyers are allowed, like the PR-30 and Ayanami. Mutsuki really should not be considered the best reserve. It's alright, but it's certainly not the best. Next is Yugomo, where they say, The main battery of this ship consists of six quick-firing 127mm guns in three twin-gun turrets. Yes, you heard that right. Quick-firing. If you've played Japanese destroyers before, you may want to pause the video and get some headache medication after hearing that. So, this is probably something that got lost in translation. They must have meant that the shells are quick due to their high velocity. For fire rate, the Japanese 127mm is worse than the main American, German, Russian, British, and Italian destroyer cannons. They have a max fire rate of 7 RPM, while the others fire at 22, 18, 8, 10, and 8 RPM in that order. To say they're fast firing is very, very incorrect. The video also neglects to mention the lack of armor-piercing ammunition for the guns. A better way to describe the main weaponry would have been more akin to, while its guns have a slow fire rate, they have excellent ballistic properties and high damage HE shells. However, they lack any form of armor-piercing ammunition. Then, segue that lack of armor-piercing ammo into talking about the torpedoes, as they can kill any target that has too much armor for the main guns to penetrate. They also talk about Kiyoshimo, despite the fact that you can't buy it anymore, it's just a bit of a strange decision. Next up is Akizuki. Most of what they say about this one is correct, until the very end. She can pull her weight in a fight, help with repairs, fend off enemy aircraft, <laughs> you name it. So, uh, apparently it can help with repairs. This is easily the strangest part of the video. Every single ship in naval can assist with repairs to squad mates, while no ship in naval can assist with repairs for players you're not squatted with. Why mention it for Akizuki? It's in no way more relevant to Akizuki than any other ship, and it's just confusing to include. Next up is Fototaka. It's worth noting that they skipped every single cruiser up to 5.7, which is a pretty huge gap. Most of those cruisers are very weak and provide a giant roadblock in the tree, so for a video about climbing the ranks, it might be worth mentioning them. For Fototaka, one part they say is of particular note. Due to the way she was designed, Fototaka can take quite a lot of punishment. Even the cruiser's magazines are pretty hard to detonate. So, this is half true. Fototaka's magazines and shells actually have no belt armor, which would make it seem like they're easy to destroy, but in War Thunder, the shells that hit them tend to overpenetrate and deal little to no damage. I wouldn't say it's designed like that, since it makes no sense to leave the magazines completely bare, but with War Thunder's mechanics, it's more survivable than it might look. Also, it also helps that uh, Furutaka is quite mobile. She can travel at the speed of up to 61 kph. The top speed of 61 km per hour is pretty average between all the trees, and below average for Japan's tree, particularly at 5.7. Every single cruiser that Japan has at 5.7 will outpace the Furutaka. There's really no reason to point out its mobility if it's completely average. Outplast for cruisers is Tone, where they actually get everything about correct. My only real criticism here is that they didn't mention Mogami, since it's worth comparing the two. Tone is more survivable while Mogami has more firepower, so there's an interesting dynamic between them. Next up is Setsu, where everything they say is sensical until… And her main caliber guns are positioned in an arrangement that makes it easy to fire on the move, making this battleship a harder target to hit. Nothing about Setsu's gun layout makes it easier to fire on the move than with any other dreadnought. 
What the gun layout does is it makes it easier to engage multiple targets at once since you can have four turrets fire on one enemy, then turn the remaining two turrets to another enemy on the other side of the ship, which is something that's worth pointing out. Last is Hyuga. Here we go. Hyuga is a super dreadnought armed with record-breaking 365mm cannons. The guns are actually 356 millimeters, which is equal to 14 inches. Most dreadnoughts were designed while the imperial system of measurement was used primarily, so all the numbers divide pretty closely to an equivalent number of inches. But here's the real mistake. As this battleship has a somewhat peculiar armum arrangement. By battleship standards, that is. Yes, the armor is laid out in a peculiar fashion, in that it's completely incorrect. I previously said that it was flipped, but I was actually wrong. It's more that the thicker top section doesn't extend down to the waterline like it should, and the barbettes are too thin. Paired with War Thunder shell room damage models and underwater ballistics, this makes Yuga incredibly easy to kill if you know exactly where to shoot it. Now, if this were fixed, it would still have a major vulnerability, that being the 30mm deck armor above the shells. But to say it has a peculiar armor layout based on Gaijin's incorrect damage model is also incorrect. Of course, I wouldn't expect them to point out a mistake like this in an official video, but maybe say that it's vulnerable due to the 30mm deck, pointing out the actual vulnerability and not the one created by errors with the damage model. And that's the end of Gaijin's video. I like the idea of making a video showing how to climb through the ranks in a tree, but if you're going to do it with naval, please make sure the information is actually correct. Naval's an underrepresented mode that's quite confusing for new players, and making a video on the official War Thunder channel that's rife with misinformation and bad advice is not going to help. I'll have my own take on this kind of video coming out soon, but I'm going to take more time since I want to make sure I don't miss anything. What tree would you guys want me to cover? Should I go over Japan like Gaijin did, or should I choose a different tree? Let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching.